Hey, 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 good morning, good morning, good morning. This is Apostle Sandy Love. And listen, I am excited today. <laughs> I'm excited about the series we started. And I must admit, I did have a few people that hit up and was like, you're supposed to be using the word perspective and not prospective. And so it's my fault. I'm going I'm to take, take the L on that one. It's my fault. Um, but we're going to dig into that. I was so excited and, and just jumped into it last week that I did not uh, define or make the difference of why it why we are going this route and why God is using it in this context. Is that all right? So we got a lot of work to do. You want to go ahead? Let's get into prayer. Remember, we're talking between two different networks. And so our time is going to have to stay limited to an hour because that is the length of time that I have on the other network. And I don't want to lose anybody. If you're looking in from Healing Wounded Eagles on YouTube or from the Facebook outing or looking at um, uh, Healing Wounded Eagles on the Hope Fellowship. Any questions on prior teachings and whatnot, we've been doing a whole year on the School of the Prophets. We ended in February. The end of February, we are done with School of the Prophets and we go back to our services. So the teaching is free is the point. So if you want more information, um, you can go ahead and hit me up through Facebook or someplace like that. Or at the end of one of my things, you know, you get the information. Is that all right? Let's go. Father God, I think I'm going to praise you for allowing us to gather here on this morning. I think I'm going to praise you, Father God, for what you're doing in the lives of your people. Father God, I think and I praise you that you are breaking up the follow ground. You're breaking up the legalism and the legalistic mindsets that follow ground that is keeping your people from being um, elevating forward. We come against every python spirit, every religious spirit, every spirit that's coming to strip, to, to, to distract your people from elevating and receiving. Now, Father God, I thank you that you're having your way. Holy Ghost, you do the teaching. You do the speaking. You do the drawing. I'm just going to repeat what you tell me to do because we always have flowed like that from the beginning of our relationship. So I give eternity praise. I give God glory by his precious son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for us. Bless this work that's about to take place in Jesus name. Amen. You just got to know where your help come from and rock with that. Now, because I am going to be looking from another screen, um, you know, I will, will, will be good. All right, so let me go ahead and pull this up here for you so you can see it. And it is prayer in prospective, part number two. Now let's go ahead and, and let's break some things down. Prospective uh, mostly generally means of or in the future. So speaking futuristic. Most commonly, it means potential or likely or even expected. It's used to describe something that might happen or that is expected to happen. You got me? Expected to happen. Prospective um, is the appearance of objects related to each other as determined by their distance from a viewer. I am not giving you my view of prayer. I am bringing you or from a place where deep is calling unto deep, futuristic, because where we have been, we are failing. I, let's, come on, let's talk about this. Where we have been is failing because as a prophet, I can tell you how many calls I get saying, can you pray for me because I feel like God doesn't hear me or how come I'm doing all this praying and nothing has happened? Why is suicide so high? Because listen, even when the disciples asked Christ to pray, why would they ask him to pray? They had been praying as a Jewish nation for centuries. What was it that they heard? What was it that they gleaned in his voice, in his delivery that let them know they had not yet come close to anything that was what? Futuristic. Come on, let's go. In the realm and the language and the nuances of words whisper tales of their origins. When we gaze through the lens of perspective, we glimpse, we glimpse from the Latin word meaning optical, and it beckons us to scrutinize closely. So I'm not scrutinizing, we're not scrutinizing. It, listen, its roots stem from the verb um, prediscior, meaning to look at. Um, and it echoes a spectacle of spectacles, so to speak. Versus prospective, it is telling us to peer into the future, the distant future. Listen, it invites us to gauge beyond the present. 
Thus, why the prefix is pro. In Hosea 4 and 6, the Bible says that my people are perishing for what? The lack of knowledge. But it's because thou hast rejected knowledge. We're content in staying in the present. But deep is calling us to what? The future. Deep to deep is not the present. Present is deep. Future deep in God means you have to move. Your your vision has to change. You have to gauge what beyond the present and move into maturity of the future. Is that all right? So here is what the disciples were doing. I, I didn't change your slides, but that was what I was reading from behind the scene. So we, so we are not dealing with introspecting. Not and we don't. We're we're telling you that you're too low. And for many of you listening to me, you've not yet even heard about the courtrooms of heaven. So if you didn't know, is that present is a futuristic. For you, you don't know it. So therefore, your present does not know. As you become aware, you're stepping from your present and you are what? Taking the step to move and to gauge or gaze forward into what? The unknown. What's the unknown? How God is asking us to work with eternity application is everything. When you don't have it, you are presently in a state of not having it. Upon attaining it, you're moving and shifting into where? A prospective mindset. All right. So I just wanted to kind of add some clarity there um, because we are very argumentative in the body of Christ. We don't know nothing about Shinola, but we're going to try to preach it. And when somebody gets up there and tries to say anything, you want to find fault with the person, the speaker and the messenger and even the message because you, your spirit is just it's rebellious by nature. Why? Because we hate change. We hate confrontation. We hate chastisement. We are a, we, we're living a world of rebellion. Why? Because Satan is the prince of this world. And every now and then that residue begins to get on us and we find ourselves questioning things that we just need to receive. In the military, can you imagine every six months we were being introduced to some new weapon, some new mindset? We had to keep shifting. They weren't shifting us from present to present to present. They were shifting us from present to future. What was the future? The weaponry we were going to use. What was the future? The 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 um the the tactics or uh, um the methodologies or the technology. They were shifting us from present to future, perspective to prospective. Let's get some prospective today. Now, last week we dealt with, and I showed you this particular uh, roadmap. And so it is my endeavor that you maintain and to understand that this same roadmap we're going to pretty much kind of stick to. So, for example, uh, last week we talked about Pela, um, which, which is the definition uh, in Isaiah when we talked about the house of prayer. So we want to maintain that. Today, we're going to focus on um, assignment and mission, the second column. We were not going to complete it all, but we're going to try to. But we're also going to begin to incorporate what we did not do in the last one uh, when it came down to um, the, um, the the clarity of uh the courtrooms of heaven, we were not able to, we went over most of them, but we did not. And the angels were one that we did not. And we're going to try to hit on that today. So that's going to be very, very important that you uh, stay tuned in, stay engaged. And as, and the reason we didn't go into it all is because a lot of this, which is why we have to deal with prayer, it works in prayer. You have to see their roles in the spiritual realm so that you can see your role in the natural realm. And then when the meeting of unity emerges with eternity, again, you have to leave here. You cannot stay here in the present and reach God out there. You have to start here and you have to know how to connect, i.e., this is where we get the prospective from. So let's go ahead and, and continue on. All right. Um, let me go ahead and change your screen over here. And let's go there. Understanding, as we did from last week, the word pela, uh, it means to judge as house is ecclesia. So it's not, it, we have to examine why is it called the house of prayer? The house ecclesia, it means, uh, the house means ecclesia and the ecclesia means legislative, judicial, and governmental. Um, and the word pela means judgment. So you have all this, uh, legal jargon talking, but we also have to understand that that house means counsel. 
All right. And you can get it. Uh, I do love that in first Kings 22 and six. We are going to go to uh, Judges 6 and 16 because I want to begin to deal with assignments. So let's go down. Like Gideon in Judges 6 and 16, you must understand that assignments and missions are not the same, but they are synonymous. So depending upon how you think or process, you could say, well, they're no different to me. I understand that from a military perspective, we see it maybe just a little different. All right. That's that. That's my perspective. OK. The difference is we understand they can be used synonymously. They're not night and day. But to a military person, they are night and day because an assignment can be one thing. A mission is a series of things. So, again, take your own perspective on how you want to look at that. Assignments are a task, a task or a piece of work assigned to someone as part of a job on a need to know basis. And you can find that Proverbs 16 and nine. Um, it says, as a man's mind plans his ways, but it is the Lord that directs his steps and makes them sure. So on this walk with God, you'll find out that he gives you small assignments. Okay. Forgive your mom. Okay. Be nice to the person that um, hurt you. That's an assignment. I.e. a test to help you develop and to grow. The mission is not go forgive your mom. That's the long-term goal, but the immediate act is an assignment. You need to bring some clarity, all right? So uh, the, uh, the, the mission, one that it means in the Bible, the word mission signifies a purpose, a purposeful movement, all right? It is about one being sent, to one place or another for a specific purpose. The apostles of Christ were among the first to be sent out on a mission to share Jesus Christ, proclaiming uh, proclaiming the gospel. The word mission in the Latin is translation to the Greek is uh, apollos, uh, ascending out. It appears uh, only once in the English New Testament, according to Galatians 2 and 8. But overall, uh, apostle, we kind of use that term, and they were sent. So they were sent out to do what? A mission. A mission. I'm not dealing with, uh, if you want to equate it to a mission in Africa, overseas, that's fine. Just for the sake of the teaching, let's just say that the mission is a long haul. But in between those mission or in that mission are a series of events that take place that help us get the mission done and completed. All right. Just for the sake of time. All right. Now let's go to the next slide. The, the, the mystery of the word mission. I am aware that the use of the words assignment and mission can be overlapped. In the context of warfare, mission is an operation or an active role that is assigned by a higher headquarters. Since the synonyms can be mission, however, as noted um, from the Latin use of the word, uh, uh, it means the Greek means uh, apostle or apollos, ascending. It appears only once in the language, a language, the New Testament, sorry, in Galatians 2 and 8. The an apollos is one that is commissioned and sent to fulfill a special purpose. Your assignment can be special, but this is not the same thing. The work of an apostle is not the same as somebody saying, go and, go and you know, ask your brother to forgive you. The missions are different. That's his mission. That's your mission. Wherever you are, that is where you are. But don't confuse the weight as that they're being equal, not even the eyesight of God. The apostles were the apostles, i.e. sent out on a mission, long-term affairs, long-term journeys, but they do begin with small assignments. Okay. Just again, clarity, but I want to, I want to teach you this word. Uh, sending isn't just apostolic, but it's also mysterion. The, the word mystery comes from the Greek word means mysterion, and it means hidden or secret thing. Not obvious to the understanding, the secret counsels which govern God in dealing with the righteous, uh, which are hidden from the ungodly and the wicked. But let me do it this way. Veron Ash, when he ministered on this years ago, it was so beautiful, and this is kind of how he put it. I'm a general, so we already established that when you are being assigned a mission, I think I read it earlier from the onset, you are being called from a higher authority and you're being asked to fulfill a mission. Okay. So let's say, let's use the military. We have 
five, six branches, six, six branches or so right now. No, we got more than six, but I think it's six. Space Force is the last one is my point. So though they work independently, when a war happens or they're sending troops to Ukraine, Gaza, or wherever they're sending troops to, the DOD will convene a higher authority, a Department of Defense. They are in the Pentagon. They're going to gather all the generals from those individual places and they're going to convene. They're convening to say, how, what is the mission if we go? How many troops are we sending? And what is going to be needed to get these that mission or the operation off the ground? Because mission deals with operation. And operation is not, let's take out his tooth. No, an operation is, again, a series of assignments that help complete, complete or make up the overall mission. So when they get done convening and they map out what they're going to do, then they back up and they begin to put the different people or uh, departments, not people, meaning the Air Force, what they're going to do, the Navy, the Marines, the Coast Guard, yada, yada, even Space Force, if needed. Everybody has to know what their role is, all right? Now, the generals know what the role is. They know what the strategy and the blueprint is. The individual people do not, because the higher the the higher the ones that make the plans have to break it down and hide some things. There is one secret. Why doesn't the general say that um, you're going to be placed in a hostile environment for 35 days on a need to know basis? They're higher up. They make the call. I'm I'm, get, I'm going somewhere. In the making the call. Your job as we go down the rank on the on the totem pole is maybe a private, an officer or a sergeant. You don't get to know all that information that they did. You just have to have your allegiance ready to move when they say to move. You don't get to say, well, and when I get there, what am I supposed to do? And what am I supposed to say? The sergeant is the sergeant will say something like this. Your your instruction is to walk to the tree. This is how Ron Ash put it so years ago when he was alive and, and, and sitting up under his tutelage. And he said that it's a military term. Mysterion in the Greek is a military term. So when you're being given an order to walk to the tree, what he's saying is this. You're not supposed to have the information. What if you're captured? If you're captured, you will give away the information up here. But if up here never gave you the information down here, then if you're captured, becoming a POW, you don't have any information to give. Why? Because they didn't give you any. Mysterion is having the ability to walk out an assignment or a mission and take orders on a what? Need to know basis. Well, that's not biblical. Yeah, it is called faith. He tells you what you need to know when you need to know it. The Bible says, I do nothing unless I reveal it to my prophets. He doesn't tell you everything. He'll tell you that you might, you're going to get married, but that marriage may be another 13 years. But he told it to you. But it didn't tell you the process or the mission or the scenic route of the mission that you were going to have to walk out. All right. Why is this important? Because when we're talking about what a mission is, we have to understand that God does not just talk to talk, but that God also he has a meaning and he has a method to how he does things. And so sometimes you have to learn how to walk under sealed orders, which is nothing but the secrecy of eternity until what the time is right. But you need to know as apostles, we walk out into these different endeavors. And though we have plans and blueprint, we're not going to tell you everything because we're not supposed to. You were not in the convening council room of God. So why do you think that we owe you some explanation? Enough on that. Let's keep moving. So the mystery is locked in the word called mission. But God couldn't reveal all matters because if you were captured, as I already mentioned, you would you would take the plan. That's why obedience is better than sacrifice. Thus, hence, again, we, we talked about this last week, Revelation 10 and 11. And he said unto them, thou must prophesy again, again, meaning that that it happened before at another generation, another time. But he's saying, for every generation that comes and hears this word, you must pick up your prophetic mantle and begin to prophesy again before many people, nations, 
tongues, and kings. We will not be entrusted with significant missions until we have proven faithful by single assignments. Thus, in the presence of God, we must enter into what? The ecclesia, the house, and open ourselves to God's governmental, legislative, and judicial way of seeing things as he sees fit and not by what we assume, okay? Thus, again, we are entering from our old perspective ideals or visual over into a prospective referring to the future or the mysteries of God's agenda for what? The next generation. Don't make me hurt nobody. <laughs> All right. So here, um, again, we're dealing with, I'm, I'm, I took this from the roadmap under, we, we dealt with mission. Okay. So now we've, it, you, you look at what we've covered. We've covered the mountain of God, the presence of God. We've covered uh, uh, Daniel 7 and 10 talks about the uh, courtrooms of heaven, that they are legitimate. We talked about the judicial matters as listed in uh, Revelations 10 and 11. Why am I calling that? Uh, judicial duties because it is telling you that you have to eat the whole roll. And when you get done eating the whole roll, that is going to be sweet to your taste buds. But the reality in the unpacking of the weight of the mission and the responsibility of the assignment is going to make you belly over and make you sick as a dog. Why? Because it encompasses everything that God wants done without giving you the individual line by line detail itemized out. But nevertheless, it says, and what you must again means that you're just picking up from the last generation of prophets. You're just picking up from the last ones that did it. You will prophesy to people, nations, kings, and whatnot. All right. Um, and now what we have not covered, of course. So let's go ahead, because what we have not covered is and we're, I know that don't sound like we're dealing with prayer. But let me put this into your mindset. Um, why I why he wants you to understand about going into battle. Old school was and this is what you did. All right, we got prayer meeting at so and so time of day. We're gonna go ahead and intercede on behalf of the church, and we go intercede on behalf of the baby ministry in the neighborhood. It wasn't wrong. Don't don't think I'm messing or I'm picking. That's not what I'm doing. But when you don't know any better, you don't know any better. So you do what you know to do, as we all did. But times are shifting and changing. And now God is requiring us to take authority and to conquer neighborhoods and whatnot. And so you couldn't figure out what was missing. You couldn't figure out why you were doing all this praying and fasting, but you had limited success or that the same people that was praying was coming up with diseases or they or that they were um, the backlash from the, or the retaliation and backlash from the prayer session had consequences. Why? Because you did, you have permission to be there. You didn't know you needed it. I got it. That's why I gave the example of the military. We don't go to war until we convene with the council of DOD, Department of Defense. We don't go into war and the Air Force can't go without us and nobody moves anything. Why? Until we have permission. And God is saying, where does your permission come from? In other words, do you even have your people together? Have you trained them? Some people will say, well, yeah, we got prayer training every week. Your prayer training is perspective. God wants you now to move to future because the, the, the fact that our churches are emptying out is a fact our prayers are not been effective. I'm sorry. Like, I, I ain't got another way to say it. Don't blame the devil. And there is only good and evil. The people that are not coming because they're being hurt. The, the, they feel like God has let them down. They feel like we got so much sin in the pulpit that it, 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 it's just it's just nasty. So why? Because our people are not in place, but we're trying to pray over mess. We're trying to pray over hurt. We're trying to pray over chaos and confusion. And we're never asking God what he wants. And then when God does expose the sin that you pray that he exposed, then you cover it up because it's the pastor. And we got to cover him because nobody needs to know that he's a whore or the stealing of money. So let's cover it up because he's the man of God. And the Bible says, touch not my anointed and do my prophet no harm. So let's cover it up. That's the problem. So now if you understood your place in the judicial house of God, you would understand how to keep the man of God covered, but yet go to the courtroom of heaven and seek what to do and how to how to minister, how to pray, how to stand in proxy for the sin within the man of God. 
or the sin within the community, but instead we attack people. We attack them if they get pregnant. We attack the drug dealers and what they're doing in the neighborhood. The drug dealers are not your problem. And you and listen, that's the other problem. You can't discern the difference between the sinner and the enemy because you think that the devil is a sinner. No, the devil's in the sinner because the devil is in the sinner, but the devil is the enemy because the enemy is the enemy, but because we don't understand the parties, we are attacking flesh and people, and then we're trying to pray. Well, you can't because you don't even know who you're fighting. One moment you like Sister Buka Book, the next one when you're talking about like a dog, but you wanna go pray for her. How you do that? That's why we're ineffective in prayer. And we keep thinking, well, I'm just, God got it. No, God ain't got nothing. You got it. And the reason you don't think, the reason we're not effective is because what we don't understand is the fact that it is God that is relying on us to work with eternity so that what our prayers can be effective. So we're going to look at uh, Judges. I believe we're going to look at Judges. Let me see it for a second. Oh, all right. So let's go to the next slide and we're going to keep it moving. Now, what gives Satan a legal claim to people's life in the bloodline? For you that already know the teaching on the courtrooms of heaven, we've already been through this, but for those that are peering in from our other network, then we're going to go ahead and sum up. But these teachings, again, contact me later. They've already been taught, and they're on our uh, free school of the prophets that we started a year ago. We end in the end of February, and we go back to doing our regular services. Why does the enemy have a legal claim in the lives of people or their bloodline? Ephesians 4 and 27, don't give place to the devil. The Greek word place means occupancy. Don't give him the deed. Don't give him the license. Don't make yourself a habitation. But before you, before you get too legalistic and spiritual and act like this cannot happen, let me tell you how the enemy builds cases right here. He builds cases through uh, Nehemiah 1, uh, five, one, five through seven. I, I can't stop right now and go to individual because this is kind of like old teaching. So please um, hit me up so I can show you where to go or just go back. If you're on YouTube, all those lessons is down there. And, and matter of fact, you're going to find uh, the courtroom of heaven in that series. So start with verse one. I mean, not verse one, start with part one courtrooms of heaven and, and, and go up to two. And this is going to be explained The the enemy has to have a legal right to do anything. When he took that right from when he took the deed and occupied that garden, they gave him the legal right. All right. He becomes the prince and the power of the air. His his cohorts, the ones he made a pact with, is running rampant now. And guess what? That is their legal right. That has been their legal right. Though we are saved and though we love God, we're still making sure that we what? contend and shut these legal rights of entry, which are what through the bloodline, accusations, which is the number one way. Uh, Job 1, 6 to 8. Again, I would love to mess with this right now, but I can't. So you got to go hear these teachings on it so that you're not confused. This is why. And then transgression, Isaiah 43, 25 through 28 deals with the father's sin, the bloodline sin and everything like that. So the point is that I'm trying to get you to understand is that for all, uh, uh, these things help you to understand how the enemy thinks and what he's doing scripturally. All right. Thus, what is our role? Why he's attacking the bloodline, bringing up accusations to show God that we're not this and we don't deserve this. Our job is still Genesis. I'm sorry, Revelations 10 and 11. When people fail to repent, intercessors can go to the courtroom and stand in proxy on behalf of someone else. Now you may say, well, well, prophets, you, you're not telling me nothing. I don't even know. I mean, we've been doing this. No, baby. You've been taking sin from the camp into the prayer. That's the first problem. The second thing is, is that when you're in there praying on behalf of people, do you like them? Or do you talk about them after you pray or before you pray for them? Next. Did you ask eternity what areas to target? Well, yeah, I told God to show me what's going on with sister so-and-so. That's not what that's not the root. The root is the same thing I just said. The root, when you're standing in proxy for someone, you, you don't know their business. 
And if you, and whatever you think you do know, you don't know. The only people or the only records that record um, uh, 1 Psalms 139 and 16, a person's book of life is God, is the courtroom of heaven. You must go and spend time in prayer on their behalf to ask eternity, show me the root. Show me the name of the spirit. What's going on? And you have to wait. This is the part we don't like because we, we want to just be like, well, I went in prayer like nine o'clock last night by 9.15. I knew what the deal was. No, you know, those are your perspectives, not your prospective, because there's sometimes you have to wait because let me tell you why you got to wait. What if you're not supposed to be the one on the assignment, but you pick it up? Well, prophet, the Bible says we ought to always to pray. We ought to always to pray, but just because we ought to always to pray does not mean that you were even given the assignment. So we're going in, and my point is we're moving into battles and into fears that you've never asked eternity should you go. David said, God, if I go, will you be with me? If I go, will you uh, uh, give the enemies into my hand? And then let's look at Samuel, because the whole life of Samuel, the Philistines never attacked the people. But the moment he died, they were infiltrated. He was on his guard. And the demons were so scared of him, they didn't come. Them giants, they didn't come nowhere now around, around uh, uh, Samuel. So it is this authority that today we just want to look good. We want to be, be the, the head intercessor. We want to be the head person. We want to be over. We want to pray for the. You're not doing, you're not going deep enough. I.e., understand why the term is what it is, why it's prospective. Because we're not. And you need more information. That's why I said before a battle ever begins, you must go to the council, the head, to find out two things. Shall I go? What's the strategy? Do I have permission? Show me what I need to do. And that's what we're going to get into more. This, But this is basic one-on-one. See, it's not just about showing you how, and we ain't even got to the prayer part. This is before you even go. So like the military, there must be a strategy. You must ask eternity, who is the counsel of all war? Can I go? Not assuming because I'm a child of God that I have the right to go and do it. Because if I'm not mistaken, I believe it is Acts 19 where we got the whole deal with the sons of Sceva, right? And let's, let's make it clear because in sons of Sceva, so we can get this together. So the, so the priest Sceva, had some sons and Skiva, as like us, uh, they put it in, in, in everyday language, they PK kids or related to his family. That's why they're called sons, whether directly or indirectly. We know that there was relationships. It does not say that they're unsaved because what we do know from the historical records I'm talking about is the fact that the sons of Skiva were what they call vagabonds. Vagabonds were not homeless people. Vagabonds was a job set and they went around casting out devils from the people. So these were not a bunch of PKs that was in rebellion. These were people that thought that probably because they were just trying to do the right thing and pe get people from not suffering, yada, yada, yada. You heard the stories in the Bible because Christ dealt with it. So these were the ones that were already casting devils out. But they messed around and heard that Christ was on the scene and what he was doing. And they felt like, well, hey, we could do what he's doing. And the Bible says that, that they jumped on him and ripped him up, tore the clothes off and said, Christ, I know. Paul, I know. But uh, who you do? So don't take for granted because you say you got permission because Skiba's sons thought they were doing the right thing, too. And it wasn't working. All right, let's continue with our prospect. <laughs> All right, now, I just mentioned this before. Do you have permission? Um, what was the history of, let's go look at Judges. Uh, do I have time to read it all? Yeah. Do I have, uh, let's go to Judges 6, 25 to 30. Let me pull it up right here. So in Judges... 6 and 16, we had where Christ basically tells, uh, uh, calls Gideon to go ahead and to uh, take down uh, the enemy. Okay, so that was what was going on. Okay, hang on. Let's see. 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 Let's see.
Let me pull this up here because Judges 6. Yeah, all right. So in Judges 6 and 16, the Lord answered and says, I will be with you and you will strike them down, the Midianites, leaving them leaving none of them alive. Now, let's un just put the theory thing into perspective. The Midianites were pillaging and taking their fields and leaving nothing to eat. But God also said there was a judgment on, listen, there was a judgment on the people because they did not do what God had told them to do. So let's not get confused here that the people were in the right. So again, why you must get the other information, not just, I want to go run and pray for them. That's not smart. Because you may have a son of Sceva or something else may happen. Why? Because you have not had permission. In this case, in Judges 6, we find out that Gideon was called. After you're called or given the assignment or the mission, you need to wait for the assignment. You're called here, but you want to go run on the mission there when there's a lot of assignments in between that prepares you for the long haul of what needs to get done. In this case, uh, uh, in Judges, we have Gideon that is called. When we go down to verse number, and you can read the whole chapter, it's phenomenal, but let's go to verse number 25. That same night, not the same night that he was called, sometime after, just put that into perspective, um, uh, the Lord said, take a second bull from your father's herd. Uh, the one seven years old, tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the asterisk pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord. That again, there's a right way to do something and there's a wrong thing. That's what that word means, proper. So the altars that they had been building, again, that goes back to our teaching uh, from a long time ago, we were talking about the altars and how to build them in accordance to Exodus and Leviticus, what God said he wanted. So these altars that they were building, they were building these altars to their deity of Baal and asterisk. So God is saying, before we can, before we can, I can send you to do any war, because that's what I want you to understand. Before I can send you to do, do, do anything else, what I first need you to do is to go over here and tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the pole of asterisk beside it. Then after you cut that stuff down, build me a proper altar to the Lord. Uh, on the top of his height or hill, because uh, they were in the high places, using the wood that Asherah's pole was cut down, offered the second bull as a burnt offering. So Gideon took 10 of his servants and did as the Lord told him. Let's stop right here because let's parallel something. God says, hey, I want you to go down there and go give uh, $20,000 to uh, apostle so-and-so and so-and-so. -and -so. so you walk down because you got the money. You got it. And you know you heard what he told you to do. So you go down there, and it's not it's not for everybody to see. You're not going to be uh, called up on the stage to give a million-dollar check. But I want you to go down there one-on-one, -on -one, and I want you to go put this $20,000 check in um, the woman of God or the man of God's hand. So you get down there, and you start looking around. And you start saying, well, let me see. What, what does it cost for you to run this every month? And I may tell you 12000 or 1200 and so you decided to give me 2000 or them 2000 and set up 20000 you're cursed with the curse why and listen in your mind well maybe i heard god say 2000 because her bills is only 12 that still gives her 800 now you heard exactly what god said do and this is why Saul got in trouble because he did what he thought was right he did what he thought was conducive and he cursed and ended his ministry you had the funds to help the church you had the funds to help the people of god but when god tells you to do something you now because you got a relationship with the Lord, you now decide that your relationship with God is so good and so uh, uh, on point that you can go ahead and disobey him and reduce the money down because you and God got it like that. And they, they're not really doing nothing anyway. I don't see why God would tell me to give 20,000. You don't say that, but that's what you do. And that's what you mean when you reduce obedience down to disobedience. The reason people disobey is because it's hard, it's scary, I don't see the point, I don't have the blueprint, I don't have the plan, and I do not understand why God would ask me to do it. So if you can't fulfill the first assignment, you will never get mission completed. That's why I say don't even confuse the two, because assignments make up missions, and if you ain't got that together, Saul, you're about to be fired. So nonetheless, here it is, we have them. 
And it says that Gideon took his servants, um, uh, afraid, uh, okay, took the 10 servants as and the Lord told him, but because he was afraid of his family and the townspeople, he did it at night, but at least he did it. He did it at night. He was trying to find some wit, but at least he did it. All right. In the morning, when the people of the town got up, um, there was bells altar demolished, as well as the polar ashes that had been cut down. And then he asked, and uh, then they asked and said, "Who did this?" And they carefully investigated, and they were told that Gideon, that Gideon, the son of Joash, did it. Um, the people of the town demanded uh, demanded that his father to bring out his son. I mean, he got to die because he has broken down uh, the altars of Baal and Ashtoreth. But his father replied to the hostile crowd and said, are you going to plead Baal's cause or are you trying to save him? <laughs> hey. Because see, last week we didn't go here. And I'm glad that we're here this week because here's what I want to ask yourself. You cannot tear down what already own you. See, the reason you got all this sympathy, I know you're going to get mad, but I got to tell the truth. I gotta, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I gave my allegiance to him, so you're going to be all right. But the reason you can't come against homosexuality is because you're a secret one in the closet. The reason you can't speak against it is because you're all your friends and people that you know are struggling in that life. So you will minister or call it out on the carpet. The reason you can't talk about getting high and doing different things of that nature is because you're secretly doing it. You cannot tear down what owns you. Right here in Gideon, he says, so you mean to tell me that you rather kill my son over your altar, over your sin that you're doing and plead for the devil versus what God is trying to do? We got a lot of problems in this world, y'all, but the word of God ain't changing for none of us. We're not saying they can't get delivered. We're not saying that we don't love them. What we're saying is we're supposed to play a role in not only bringing prophetic lawsuits, don't have time to teach it. Go back and get the lesson. But within the, the prophetic lawsuit, repentance, reconciliation, it's all in there. But you just don't want to talk about it and deal with none of it. Why? Because there's something going on in you. Well, you, you don't understand. You don't understand. You know, my family. Man, I can't say what I want to say. So ninjas, let me help you. Got them in our family too. And I love them. And I, I learned to let love speak. But if God give me a word to say, I speak it. I deal with youth. I have a youth company. It ain't faith-based. It's regular youth. So I don't heard about the studs, the transgender. I love them. I don't kill them and I don't condemn them. And sometimes it's not even good for me to touch those areas when I do not have a relationship with them. So I build relationship so they know my heart. They can vet me. We've been doing this for a long time. Some of my kids have lasted about 10 years of mentoring. Yes, 10 plus years of mentoring, just about, not quite 10, but around there, about eight or nine of mentoring so that they can vet Miss Sandy. They know they can trust Miss Sandy. They know that even if I don't like what she's saying, I know she's not being mean. I know she's not being vindictive. She's not beating me with the Bible. She's using the Bible to still love me, but to show me that God has a better way. And some of this stuff that we got to contend with and deal with, the reason we're scared to confront it is because it owns you. So all in my family. I deal with it. I work with it, but I want their soul to be saved in the end. It's no different than a fornicator or the molester in the pulpit. I'm talking about. Well, that's not his anointing. He can preach, but he molested my baby. That's okay. But you're talking about the homosexual. So you want to beat the homosexual down and expose him and tell him how he going to hell. But the man of God or the woman of God sitting in the pulpit, molesting our teenagers, trafficking our young people, stealing the money. You're telling me we don't say nothing because he's God's anointed. Have you lost your mind? But the reason you can't tear it down is because it owns you. 
and that pastor owns you and you own his dirt and you refuse to pray and to intercede. You refuse to go to war with the demons that have him enslaved. You refuse to take the instruction of God. I don't know who it's for, but I'm going to walk until it drop. You refuse to hear the instruction of what God is saying so that you can contend with that thing and get him delivered. If that deliverance comes by hook, crook, or jail, something got to happen. But you don't know what to do because you haven't went further enough into the courtrooms of heaven to get the release. Let's go read this again, because I want to make sure we understand. Gideon's father says, are you going to plead Baal's cause? Are you going to keep pleading the cause of hell? Are you trying to save hell? Whatever fights for him shall be the death by morning. If Baal really is God, he can do, he can what defend himself when someone breaks down his altar. In other words, you 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 ready to you get ready to kill me over something that the devil is doing and you can't see it. You won't even stand up and fight for the demon of nicotine in your mouth. You won't even fight the demon of perversion or incest in your bloodline. You won't even fight the demon of prosperity in your in your uh, teenagers. You won't even fight the demons of gossiping out of your mouth. But you got the nerve to want to sit over here and fight the men and women of God that take the stand in accordance to what their mission is from the kingdom of God. You'll defend hell at all costs, but you'll beat up the men and women of God. Yes, I know they're not perfect. None of us are, but you rather beat them down than to turn around here and deal with the sin and the foolishness in your own life. Therefore, you can't stop smoking, drinking, sexing, or nothing else because it owns you. You are its slave and it is your pimp. And until you take a stand as the prophet had to do in his assignment was tear it down. Come on now. Verse number 32. So because Gideon broke down Baal's altar, they gave him the name Jerubel. Uh, that day saying that let Baal contend with him. In other words, we ain't going to help you. Because we don't believe in what you're doing. So your new name is going to be let, the, let hell deal with you. We drop each other for no reason. And this is why I know that our prayer gatherings are, if our prayer gatherings were working, so many people wouldn't have been dropped. Well, I don't like how she prays. She don't need to be in an intercessory prayer group anyway. Well, let her go on about her business. Shade. Gossiping foolishness won't even stand what it, what it is. You're intimidated because she prayed better than you. You're intimidated because he can get something done. You are afraid of somebody's name getting beyond yours. So therefore you turn them over to Satan like you done done something. This is why we know the prayers ain't working. Because the fruit is that there is that our babies are being abandoned and molested. People are being asked to leave church. Where in Jesus, did he tell them to, uh, what did he tell his disciples, don't follow me no more? They left on their own choosing, not because he put them out. But today is your organization. You're telling them, and this is what you got to understand. I'm going to get in trouble. This is the kind of stuff that we got to pray for. I'm saying a lot, but I'm not, I'm not wrong in what I'm saying and it's not misplaced because it does have to do with prayer. You want to know why? Remember in uh, Revelation 10 and 11 where it says, after he tells him, eat the roll, he says, it's going to be nice to your taste buds. But baby, when it hits your belly, it's going to tear it up. It's going to give you the runs. Want to know why? Because what is going on, it ain't pretty. It don't smell good. It's going to make you sick as a dog to hear the truth of the hypocrisy that you walk in. But I am commanding you, as I did other generations, prophesy. Let's, let's make it simple. Prophesy means to foretell. It don't mean tell them what they want to hear. You tell them what I'm saying that, that, that they need to know. And we can't prophesy, which means foretell or render anything until we get with the Holy Ghost and the courtrooms of heaven. And then if the Holy Ghost say rebuke or to chastise, you are to do it without no problem. This is our reasonable service. So, prophets, if you've already been there, then this is your perspective. But if you know you got to go further and understand about this courtroom of heaven and what it means and you need that teaching, this is going to be your perspective. 
And I believe it's prospecting for everybody because God is saying, if what you was doing was working, you wouldn't be, you still wouldn't be gossiping to my people and writing people off and putting people out of church. When you put somebody out of your church, that is your organization. Let's be clear what's happening. You can't put people out the body of Christ, but you can put them out of your organization, which means that you are God and you are God of that organization and God of God. You have abandoned everything that he said because there's nowhere that gives you the right to use a scripture to put anybody out. I would love the hell out of them until either they change or leave. Because that's how we do our families. We might put some space in, but they still fam. You don't throw your kids away. Even no matter how much you try to. But that's another thing. So let's continue. So we need to have permission to go to war. Let me make sure I read all this. Um, the history. So the history, The re before you go to war, you need permission. First thing is, what's the history? That's what we went to. We went to judges. When you read the whole chapter, you get the history of everything that was going on, and then you find out what the legal, what were the legal issues they sinned. The legal right that the enemy was there was because they had rebelled on God, and God gave them, put them under a judgment. This is what is said in that whole chapter. I'm just breaking it down simpler for you. In other words, if I'm getting ready to pray with somebody and I do not have these basics, I need to go somewhere and sit down before I do more harm than good or um, have a, an X-19 issue. So uh, next is what's the instruction? Look at just what happened to, um, to Gideon. God gave him instructions. Next, it says make war or release. We'll come back that to another thing. Who are your players? Meaning what's your prayer team? Uh, what is the name of the spirit? These are things that I was taught years ago and baby, they work. It ain't no front. It ain't old school. That's why when they, when they took spiritual warfare and they moved it from, let's not talk about this no more because everything is not a devil. Don't get me started on that either. But let's talk about money and wealth and money cometh, money cometh. Grab it, grab it, grab it, grab it. So, 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 so. Now look at what we produce. A bunch of powerless people who couldn't smell a roach, cast out a headache, or let alone cough up cough up anything other than some air. We are powerless. We have a form of godliness, but we do not have power because we allow people, organization, legalistic churches or, or uh, hierarchies to tell us that you need, to, you need to upgrade into money now because you're poor. And so now we swindle and we put pressure on people and 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 we 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 bleed the people of God dry all in the name of God and God ain't nowhere near any but all the money they give you you can't cast out they cold they bills are still due they're struggling every year but you sit up in your Rolls Royce and then wherever else and you talk about you doing the will of God. I'm not saying nothing is wrong with having a Rolls Royce, but the point is this if your people are still suffering and can't meet their bills, you say it's a lack of faith, but they're giving their tithes faithfully because you preach it. Or demand it, whatever word you want to use that fit. But the truth of the matter is, how many leaders, for real, for real, go up in that courtroom of heaven? If you knew how, how, and we'll we'll talk about, no, that's in the teaching too. I don't have to repeat that, but we may revisit it because, as an example, it's because that's what Christ did. When he says, Peter, Satan decides to sift you. That word sift means he keeps asking for you. He, he keeps asking for permission to have you. He says, but I pray for you. Can we just stay right there? Because y'all think I don't know where I'm at. I ain't new to this. I'm true to this. Why does Christ say, but I prayed for you? When he says, I pray, listen, I interceded for you. Well, prophet, that ain't no deep revelation. I mean, come on now. You ain't saying nothing. Okay. Check us out. The son of God didn't pray for Peter. The son of God did not intercede for Peter. It was Jesus, the man that did. What's the difference? He had not yet ascended. When the moment he takes his place, his whole status changed. Christ was telling us and not telling, showing us from an example that just like he stepped in and contended and interceded on the behalf of, of the uh, later to be apostle Peter, Satan, listen, he said, Satan desires to sift you. He keeps asking for you. 
He wants our permission. He Listen, he had built up. That's why I said you got to go back and get the lessons. He built up the cases to show his anger, his, his um, transgression, his bloodline curses and crisis. But I refuse to let him have you. So as a man, before I leave here into what God wants me to sit on the throne and do, I, I, I interceded for you. I did it as a man. Because if you sit here and say, if you sit here and say, well, he was always Christ. No, 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 no. Because if he was always Christ, he could have handled things another way. He couldn't come in none of his glory. He couldn't call not one angel down. None of it. So at this point, why would he call an angel down? Because he had to walk it out as a man to do what? To show us how to walk it out as human flesh. This is why it is important. So when you see prayer the way the way that 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 Christ did that thing for Peter is so that you understand. I don't care what your title is. And listen to me. I'm so sick of this because we know we got on this topic. I was talking to somebody. Right. We was on this chief apostle thing. Right. So some ignorant person said, well, um, we were talking about how these titles that people are throwing around and whatever. And so somebody has said, well, Christ was the chief apostle. So let me see if I got this right. So because Christ is considered to be the chief apostle or chief cornerstone, you think that it's okay to take Christ's title and put it on yourself. You like it in yourself to Christ? Where did they do that? Where did they do that at? Listen. I'm going to keep wasting a lot of time and not wasting, but you know what I mean. Let's keep moving and get through this. All right. So we get we dealt with permission and all the uh, things we're going to go into. Um, I want us to go ahead and look at this before we get ready to close it out. Learn to build your case. Now, listen, this is very important that you really get this because I just showed you how the enemy is looking for ways to build his case against you. To what? Everything that happens is based upon legality. That's why, uh, for example, we talked about the altar some time ago. God was telling them, this is how I want you to build an altar. Well, guess what? They That was how to build an altar. It didn't say a God altar. We just read right here in Judges. He said, build me a proper altar, which means build it to me and use my specifications. But building an altar was normal. I.e., when Satan wants to build a case, he uses your bloodline, transgression, and accusations. He is constantly building a case. Here's the problem. But you don't know how to build a case against him. Nor do you know how to build a case for somebody you're interceding for. This is why we talked about knowing how to go to God. We'll repeat it again in this series. How to go to God in prayer as in what? Father, intercessor, and judge. But as you go in these different dimensions and areas on behalf of other people, you have to build the case. Why? Because when you go to pray on their behalf and to say whatever you're going to say, Satan has a, a right to come and show up before God to build his case and make his petition. Well, that's not biblical. I think it is because I think in Joe 1, 6 through 8, he had to come before God and God had, he had to give God an account of his goings. Where you been? Seeking who I can devour. Paraphrasing. You get the point. So you must learn, again, y'all want to jump into prayer for what? You don't even know how to enter. So before you before you can pray, and don't misunderstand me, there are times God's going to wake you up and have you intercede and pray for people. I get it. But prayer should also be intentional. What's going on in our nation right now is intentional. It's sickening me to watch rebellion trying to listen, trying to take over the White House. This spirit that y'all talking about is of God, but it's not of God. According to Ezekiel 22, you are trying to usurp authority. You're trying to take control. And y'all talking about this God because you don't know the word of God. And you think that because you, you're coming in one with an agreement of rebellion. Tell me in the word of God where Satan conquered. Tell me in the word of God where it said, for example, I just read an article yesterday and Trump said, I wish I could find it. It said, Trump said, when I agreed to be president, I never agreed to uphold the Constitution. So therefore, the 14th Amendment cannot tell me what I can do to run for president. Are you serious? And y'all up and talking about, well, that's God's choice. 
It sure is. Well, then Satan need to, Satan needs to, uh, I don't want to be careful how I say this, but then what you're saying is that Satan was right and trying to take over heaven. But it's the same characteristics. I'm not doing nothing. You're not going to tell me nothing. I'm the president. I don't have to respect another president. The other president leaves out. What does he do? Oh, I ain't going to show up. I'll put everybody in jail. Talk about me. I'll take your job. Matter of fact, when I become, this, this is his word. When I become president, not only am I going to get rid of all the aliens, you know what I mean? When I say immigrants, correction, but I'm going to make it to where nobody's going to vote me out again. He's waiting to get in there to use authority that the people gave him to do what he want to go and do. And I'm going to let everybody that created, that did insurrection, I'm going to let all the white supremacists go. Why? Because I'm the president. And you're too stupid to understand that if you're a black and a minority and don't have nothing or barely making it, he is kids. He is trying to reinstate white supremacy, which is the uh, program, I believe, is 2025. Go look it up. And you sitting over here talking about the homosexual, but the stuff you need to be praying for, like in Revelation 10 and 11, prophesy again, what? Against nations and kings and people. Come on now. Really? Well, I don't know what God wants me to do, but y'all love fighting. You love arguing. You love picking out people's negative. Well, girl, you know, she spelled that word wrong. Do you know how many emails I got on that? And I said, don't they realize that if the word is up there, it might be up there for a reason. You're so busy trying to be right that your whole world is dying. Your kids, your grandkids, your babies, your nieces, your uncles, and you ain't going to do nothing. And when God is asking you to pray, well, child, they don't want to be saved. They don't want to be saved. Ain't nothing I can do about it. But I love the Lord. I'm highly favored. When you're going through, then you want all the accolades and attention. But you won't even render to anybody else that needs help. You, my friend, are a hypocrite. And you don't have to worry about helping nobody because Satan is building his case on you not to care. And when you go to God to ask God anything, know what he's going to say? <laughs> well, I know you don't want to call her because didn't you say she's supposed to help the poor? Give to the, don't your word say help the homeless? See, the reason that God's word is, is it, like again, must be respected. God can't even be divided in himself. That's why Satan uses the legal right through sin and, and different things of that nature to get a legal hold into something so that you can't refute him. So if you won't go to prayer for me, know what you're going for or anybody. How do I build a case? Let's try to get over this, some of this thing. Example, learn how to build a case. What's the history of other demographic? What are the prophetic words spoken? What are some of the prophetic lawsuits or warnings that God gave? What's the witchcraft? What's the major sins in the area? Understand the the legalities on uh, on the matter. What's the target area? Is it a generational curse? Is there a demonic covenant or other? What's the council's instruction? Meaning God, what is God saying to do on the issue? It takes time. You cannot go into a courtroom and only one person be prepared. Pronounce the judgment. This is, this is where uh, Revelation 19 and 11, this is where Christ, um, it says that Christ comes, he opens up the envelope. He comes to make war and to, or to bring judgment and to make war. Well, what does God want from us? Does he want us to pronounce a judgment or is it to make war? We don't know because we don't ask. What is eternity saying about the issue? Who are the players uh, in this whole spectrum of what's going on? What's got, got them demonic? What are the names of the demonic things? What's the hidden information that we do not have? We're so busy wanting to be able to get up in front of the church and look good and tell people what we did and how we did it that we don't seem to understand. This is why this is called prospective because you're not doing this. And I'm not giving you my perspective. I am giving you futuristically what God says you have been lacking as a body. You do not know how to govern my church. You do not how to bring judicial and legislative and governmental issues or matters before the kingdom of God. And when you do, you put yourself in the place of God and you do not seek me as to how to handle things because you want to be seen. You want to be God and you want to make the decision. And I did not give you the authority for that reason. We're going to have to reevaluate how we do things. I went through that kind of fast. 
Um, next we have, we deal with angels. We're not going to go into that. We're going to go. So again, all of this is what you need before you even should go into prayer for somebody. Now you want to go God and talk about yourself and what you did and how you need to be cleaned up. That's the first level of prayer. Father, stay right there. Matter of fact, let's make a distinction. The, the when uh, And we'll go through it scripturally again when we get back to that part. But for right now, yep, stay right there. It's all about you. Get your hips together. Say on that altar. Say on that altar about your attitude. You're gossiping. You're talking. You're robbing God. You're robbing people. You're lying to get stuff. You're doing dry begging. You're doing all this kind of stuff to be seen, to cater to yourself. Keep your hips on that altar and ask God to fix you before he puts you in any assignment. Because by the time we get to level two in accessory prayer and interceding for people, if you do not know how to build a case that's going to help them, you are adding more warfare to your to their life and you're putting yourself in a position because maybe you were not the one that was supposed to do it. Yes, we want you to always pray. Yes, if you got two minutes to give to a prayer file, but know that you're not the only one on the assignment or you may not have the major role of the assignment to pray for that particular person because somebody needs to know how to go in and get people delivered but they have to know what they're doing and that's why we are on this journey we're going to give you all these tools so that you will know how to do it and we're not going to have any issues real talk straight up Father God, I thank and I praise you for allowing us to gather here for this last hour. I pray that they will go back and get this information. I pray that they are arrested from the information and make them study and make them hear what eternity is putting a demand on. And Father God, I give you praise and I give you honor in Jesus name. Amen. But that being said, this is Apostle Sandy Love. We're going to see you next week with part number three of what? Prayer in what? Prospective. God bless.